welcome, welcome, welcome. Hallelujah. Jesus is here. Jesus is here. All things are possible because Jesus is here. Hallelujah. I was thinking about him today. Colossians 1 describes him to me. Starting in verse 15, it says, We look at this sun and see the God who cannot be seen. We look at this sun and see God's original purpose in everything created. For everything, absolutely everything, above and below, invisible and visible, rank after rank after rank of angels, everything got started in him and finds its purpose in him. He, listen, this is like one of my favorite verses. He was supreme in the beginning and leading the resurrection parade, he is supreme in the end. From beginning to end, he's there, towering far above everything, everyone. So spacious is he, so roomy, that everything of God finds its proper place in him without crowding. <laughs> Listen, when you step into Jesus, there's plenty of room. And in Him, there you are, surrounded by everything that pertains to godliness. In Him, everything that pertains to God finds its proper place. <clears throat> He's so roomy that everything of God finds its proper place in Him without crowding. Not only that, but all the broken dislocated pieces of the universe. Have you ever been one of those broken, dislocated pieces of the universe? People, things, even animals and atoms get properly fixed and fit together in vibrant harmonies, all because of His death, His blood that poured down from the cross. You yourselves are a case study of what he does. Who in the house is a case study of the salvation of Jesus? Who can stand and say, I'm a case study that he heals. I'm a case study that he delivers. I'm a case study that he sets free. Let's stand and worship him tonight. Hallelujah.
Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my turn Till I met you Jesus Come on I was breathing but not alive All my failures I tried to hide It was my tomb It was my tomb Till I met you You called my name
talks about anything that he wants to, amen. Come on. Just as the man who was thrown on the bones of Elijah, if there's any The stone that was rolled at the tomb in the garden. What happens when God says to move? I feel Him moving it now. I feel Him moving it now. I feel Him moving it now. Do it now. Do it now. This is the sound of dry bones rattling. The praise make a dead man walk again. Come on. Open the grave. I'm coming out. I'm gonna live, gonna live again. Open the grave. I'm coming out. I'm gonna live, gonna live again. Open the grave. I'm coming out. I'm gonna live, gonna live again. This is the sound of travel.
do something tonight as we sing. You deserve the glory. Come on, lift your hands. Say, I'm the Lord, I lift my hands in worship as we lift your holy name. Come on, go ahead and say, You deserve the glory. of it all. Amen. Come on, sing it out. Say, you are great. You do miracles all the way. There's no one like you. There's no one else like you. There's no one like you. second of my life this is yours so I leave it for you
lift your offering to the Lord. of age or younger I want you to come down here to the front I want you to get there in real close we're going to sing that again I want you to lift your hands I want you to worship the Lord as we sing it once again together and real close so there's plenty of room family member or someone you feel led to come and stand with I want you to come and stand with them as we sing it one more time let's sing it your word
For there to be a revival in America, it has to start with young men and young ladies. It can't hit the older crowd because we're not going to live as long. And for a revival to be sustained, it's got to hit young people. And so our young people have got to speak in tongues. They've got to cast out devils. They got to have visions. They've got to prophesy. They have to be as bold as a lion. They have to be fearless. And so as we continue to sing this one more time, I want you that have come to stand behind these young men and young ladies. I want you to begin to pray for them in the Holy Ghost. If you have sons and daughters and family members and grandchildren, I want you to begin to speak their names out. Come on, speak their names out to the Lord. Come on. Come on, pray bold prayers. Come on, pray with boldness. you to lay your hand on your heart. I want everyone to pray with me. Say, Lord Jesus, you have a plan for my life. Devil, you're not included in that plan. Get out of my life. Get out of my home. Take your hands off my future. I belong to Jesus. Father, cleanse me from every sin. Bring me through every weakness. May I be the person you've called me to be. Tonight, this night, impart to me that anointing of the Holy Ghost. As the gospel is preached, as a prophetic voice comes forth, lodge inside of me. Call me, O oh God. Open up the right doors. Close the wrong doors. Bring people across my pathway that I can bless them and they can bless me. Father, I mean this prayer from the depths of my heart. I want us to pray the Lord's Prayer together. I prayed that prayer 10,000 times or more. Every time you pray it, there's power released. Come on, pray it with me. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us of our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Come on, give the Lord a great big praise for that. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Before you're seated, I want you to introduce yourself to at least three people. Tell them your first name, 
Tell them something they'll remember. How many are here tonight and you have never been to a service with Prophet Robin Bullock before? This will be your first time. How, let me say that again. How many have been to a service with Robin Bullock before? All right. Well, tonight we're going to receive an offering. One is for the expense of the conference and then there'll be a second offering received at the end. But this offering goes to uh, pay for the expenses of the meeting. And uh, I have a book that I've written entitled The 100-Fold Blessing. This is a life changer, and I really mean that. Some people operate in a 30-fold blessing. They, uh, some operate in a 60-fold blessing. Some operate in a 100-fold blessing. If you just pray... The Bible says the Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. That's a 30-fold blessing. If you, if you pray and you plant seeds, the same promise that God gave for prayer, He also gave for giving. He said, and the Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. And so if you give, you get the, praying, the blessing for giving and the blessing for for praying, that's a 60-fold blessing. But to receive the 100-fold blessing, you have to add fasting to your prayers. And so when a person prays, when they give, and when they fast, it releases that 100-fold blessing. And this is a season around the Passover time through Pentecost where God releases the blessing of Deuteronomy 111 where God blesses you a thousand times more. How many believe God can bless you that way? Well, you know, God blesses an apple seed. He blesses an apple seed 25,000 times more. One apple seed can produce a tree that has an average of five seeds per apple and will produce 5,000 apples. Now, does God love you more than he loves an apple? Well, I believe God can do great and mighty things for you. I want to give this book for everyone who gives something. I'm going to lay it right down here at the front. You can pick that book up. I call them bathroom books. You can go in the bathroom and read my book. <laughs> Hallelujah. <clears throat> but also, I have the Bible. This is the Tim LaHaye Prophetic Bible. Uh, Tim LaHaye's in heaven. And by the way, Charles Stanley went to heaven today. Wow. Wasn't he a great man of God? But I have this Bible. This is the Prophecy Bible. And uh, we bought every Bible he had. There are no other Tim LaHaye Bibles in, in, uh, in print as yet. And so I want to give this for those who will help underwrite this conference with a gift of 100, 120 Dollars, And they're up here as front uh, as well. We're going to have a march, and I want you to bring your uh, offering to the front when we do. If you have a check, make your check payable to Evangel, and uh, praise God. Let's all stand. Everybody standing? Say with me, I love to give, love to, give. To, the work of God. to the work of God. Let's say it again with a smile on our face. I love to give to the work of God. I want you to turn your attention to our screens as we make this proclamation together. Lord Jesus, I come into your house, not empty-handed, but bringing my tithes and offerings according to Malachi 3.10. The windows of heaven are open to me. Blessings are being poured out that I cannot contain. The devourer is rebuked for my sake. This year is a continuation of the Jubilee blessings. 
By faith, I have a better job, promotions, raises, bonuses and benefits, business opportunities, sales and commission increases, inheritances, rebates, settlements, and checks in the mail. I expect favor, interest, royalties and scholarships, gifts, surprises, and newfound monies. I'm using wisdom and self-control in my spending. My bills are decreasing and my income is increasing. I have the anointing for blessings, equipping me to be a giver for the kingdom of God. All my needs are met and there is no lack. I have power to create wealth. The favor of God's upon me and everything I put my hand to will prosper. I'm a cheerful giver, sowing in good ground that's bringing souls to the kingdom of God and my God supplying all my needs. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise God. Say checks in the mail. You know, usually when somebody says that to you, that means you're not getting a check. But, uh, but the checks in the mail, newfound monies, inheritances, rebates, promotions, scholarships, Listen, it doesn't stop. It just keeps coming. It overtakes us in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Father, thank you for the privilege of giving. May this offering be more than enough. In Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. God bless you as you begin to come and bring your offering.
Come on, give the Lord a great big praise clap. Praise the Lord. I want to know, I want to know who is here tonight from Alabama. Anybody make it up here from Alabama? Well, these singers did, and these worshipers, and the prophet has come up here. Hallelujah. How many, how many will have driven over 100 miles, though, to be here in these services? Stand up so we can see who you are. Just look around here just a moment. Remain standing. This couple right here, James and Linda Silva, wave at everybody, have come all the way from Wisconsin. They drove down here to be in these services. Come on, give them a great big hand. Over here, where did y'all come from? Ohio. Ohio, all right. Over here, Indiana. How many Indiana folks? Wave at me. All the Indiana folks sat down. Hallelujah. Right here. Ohio. Give these Buckeyes a great big hand. Amen. Who have I missed? Key West, Florida. All right. I'd like to visit you about January the 10th. Hallelujah. These ladies over here from Kentucky. Well, there we go. Hallelujah. One of this couple right here, real loud. Knoxville, Tennessee. Good to see you. Hallelujah. This lady over here, real quick. All right, all right, praise God. Let's give everybody a great big hand as they come. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Well, I think tonight is going to be an evening that God releases something that we've been waiting for. This is the icing on the cake. Can I hear an amen? Let's give him a great big love of a welcome. Hallelujah. Great to have you here. everybody all across this
Lord, we thank you for this night. We thank you for your anointing, Lord. We thank you for your absolute goodness. And Lord, I give you praise and honor and thanksgiving. Hallelujah. Let's lift our hands and bless him. Come on, we'll bless the Lord tonight. We'll give him honor. We'll give him praise and thanksgiving. Hallelujah. Welcome to a sound check. You ever been to a sound check? All right, we're checking the mics. Checking the mics. there
is a time and a place for a sound. A sound, yes, a sound. A sound that is so vast and so huge that it makes hell tremble beneath. For they fear the sound of the Holy Ghost more than anything else and the frequencies of God. Hallelujah. Listen to the sound. Listen to the sound. Listen to the sound.
but it's the sound of coming out of the cave. What am I talking about? David stayed in the hole for a long time. But the time came when he heard the sound in the trees. And the time came when it was time for David to leave and fetch a compass behind. Win the battle and fetch a compass behind and win the battle coming out of the cave. begin to hear this morning before I got up and I'm not sure how to tell it yet but I heard it and I begin to hear it early before daylight and I'm, heard, I'm, I'm searching for a sound right now I don't play a lot of music for music I play music for sound I'm looking for a sound
Lord. We stand here tonight in this place. Lord, looking for the depth of what you have for us now. Yes, Lord. It is later. And we come before you with our young and our old and our little ones. Lord, we come before you tonight to hear from heaven. And to hear a sound that's ancient and older than the earth. A sound that you made when you gave life its very birth. Lord, the frequencies that the angels shouted in when you laid the foundations of the earth. And Lord, we lift our hearts and our voices, our sound tonight to tap into that, to hear what is to come. a cave early this morning I heard a sound it's in a country right next to Pakistan and it crosses from one to the other and it is a sound it's a sound of sinister and it's a sound of terrible days and the Lord said when you get there tonight tell this thing tell this thing and so I do what is this sound it's the sound of ravenous birds to pray about to be sent in to the fray into the east birds that fly and cause destruction with no man at their helm next to Pakistan what is this we hear about Turkey let me in the fight, Turkey says. Let me in. For I am the original evil. Let me in. But nay, says the Lord, nay, for there is a revival building in Turkey. And there's a sound coming up from the ground in Pakistan that is going to drown out and throw off course the ravenous birds. For now, hear these words. For I have given Israel a targeting system that will not miss. I have given them something that will not turn and it will not miss. For Benjamin Netanyahu called on me and said I would fight with him. I would fight for him. And so I shall. For a long time is gone since a leader of Israel has called for my help, says the Lord. But this one has, so I come. And they will not miss. And they will not fall. And a miracle will happen in front of all of y'all. Hallelujah!
Hallelujah. Something gets to stirring in my spirit and I can't stop until it gets out. Let's just do something like this. You want to do it? How much you mean to me I want to tell you I want to tell you Just how much you mean to me Just how much You mean to me Just how Just how much you mean to me I want to tell you I want to tell you Just how much you mean to me Just how much You mean to me Just how
sound deep inside of your bones There is a sound, it's a sound from home God breathed it in your life before you were born Come on! There is a sound deep in your bones There is a sound and it came from your home inside your DNA some of you are looking kind of at me like a dog at a new pan I'll guarantee you one thing if King David was here tonight he would plug in his electric heart right over there and he would jam there's got to be a sound Say it. there's got to be a sound Come on, say it. There's got to be a sound that drags hell down. There's got to be a sound. 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 Oh. That drags hell down. Come on, say it with me. There's got to be a sound. There's got to be a sound There's got to be a sound Come on! There's got to be a sound That drags hell down Can you make that sound? Can you make that sound? Come on, Tommy! Come on, Tommy, play! Can you make that sound? Come on! Come on! Can you make that sound? Do it right. Ella bottom that is Nella bottle
shackles off, shake them off today. Shackles on, shake them shackles on, shake them shackles on, shake them off today. You ready now? Shackles don't fit my feet no more. Those shackles don't fit my feet. Shackles don't fit my feet at all. Shackles don't fit. My feet. Come on, come on, say Shackles don't fit my feet at all Shackles don't fit my feet Shackles don't fit my feet at all Shackles don't fit my feet My hands, come on Shackles don't fit my hands at all Shackles don't fit my hands Shackles don't fit my is looking to take his people into another place there is a place that's new to us but not to him it's a place that you know in the Hebrew text it teaches us that when he created the world and he said light be so there there were such explosions and such earthquakes and such there was such fire and such Things happen so big. If a man had have been there, it would have consumed him in his bones. It would have fallen to the ground just to have witnessed it. See, there's a fire and a depth in God that the church hasn't seen because the church refused to turn and move on into that place. We thought the fires of one or two revelations was as far as we were supposed to go. But that's not true. There's more to God than we have ever known. And he invites us to come. But in order to come in, we're going to have to be in a place. We're going to have to be willing to say, yea, Lord, yea, Lord. 
We're going to have to be willing to sing something we haven't sang before. Dance like we've never danced before. Move like we've never moved before. When Moses, the prophet, walked up before the burning bush, the Lord told him, he said, take off your shoes. The place you're standing is holy ground. What he was saying to him was this, take those shoes off because the way you've walked all your life won't work up here in front of this bush. So he's calling you and I to become barefoot prophets. Walking on ground we've never walked before. Walking in a way we've never walked before. Talking to things we've never spoke to before. Can, do, can God talk to you from a bush? Well, we have record that he can. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But the bush burns, but it's not consumed. That means it's an absolute good fire. There's a fire that burns to the ground, and there is a fire that takes to a higher place. And God calls us to that place. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Bless the Lord. you and I to come where angels cannot draw to the seat of fire the seat of fire the place that is higher the seat of fire a sight to see and a wonder to behold for hear the word of the Lord for I have a place for you and your children and their children and theirs after them for the enemy has filled the earth yes and a lot of my churches and he's robbed them of their identity 
and therefore he has stolen their destiny. But the Lord says, there is a place by me. Come and see. Come and see what I will do for you. Come and see what I will talk to you about. Come and listen. Give me all you have. And I'll show you what life is about. It's a place to live on a plane you've never knew existed before. It's a level that you didn't even know was there. But I'm there, says the Lord. And I will lift you up into my face. And don't be afraid, for I smile at you. And I will show you what I intended all the time. On this seat of fire, a place that is higher, come and join me, says the Lord. I await your answer. the future and I'm looking at yours says the Lord and it's bright it's as bright as I can make it for you it's full of goodness and light I never called you to suffer and I never called you to cause you pain for this came from an enemy impersonating me and even using my name but I am the God who is absolutely good. I am the God who will show you these facts. I am the God who calls you back to the blood, to the blood, to the spirit and the blood. Come back to the blood, to the spirit and the blood. Come back, says the Lord, and I will make your future bright. I have something just This place on high, come boldly to my throne. Put your hands on my arms of my chair, lean into my face and declare, and I will welcome you there.
Come on and shout before your God. I, uh, I want to talk to you about something. How many of you can sense his presence in the room now? See, if we, if we move for the sound, Elijah said, I hear the sound of an abundance of rain. In the upper room, there was the sound of a rushing mighty wind. It was a sound. Scripture declares in the book of Job that the sons of God shouted for joy. Shouted for joy when he laid the foundations of the earth. That means the earth was put together in frequency. They weren't shouting just because they were happy. They were shouting because that's the way it's laid in place. Everything has a frequency. This table has a frequency. It's made up of matter, so inside this table it, it, it vibrates. The molecules move. They're not alive. There's not going to be baby tables here in the morning. <laughs> but it is made up of matter. And did you know there's something that's really wild that if you could match the frequency of this table, you could pick it up off the ground and never touch it. Now you know how the great pyramids were built, how Noah built the ark with those huge timbers, lifting them with sound. Everything is settled upon a sound. And when the Lord returns one day, how does he return? with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, with music, frequencies, and sound. And it vibrates, and everything begins to move toward that sound to respond to his voice. And the dead will raise. Hallelujah. I'm going to tell you of a, of a story and I'm, we're going to take a journey through the Scripture. All prophetic utterance, all gifts of the Spirit, everything in the kingdom of God, everything to do with God is subject to this book. It's not subject to the book of Enoch. Well, now we hate you, Brother Robert. Since when did we lift the book of Enoch or Jasher or any other book up to this book? There's nothing wrong with studying history. But if it goes against this book, then it must be thrown out. Well, people say, well, that's not all the, 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 that's not all the books. There, there's lost books. Really? Really? So God wasn't big enough at, by the end time to get us everything, that uh, the whole true word. He, he just couldn't do it, could he? I mean, I mean, he tried, but you know how asinine that sounds. Now, everything's put together with frequency. Everything's put together with sound. Now, we're going somewhere. Look at your neighbor and say, man, we're going somewhere tonight. <laughs> So everything is put together that way. You have a frequency. There's a frequency inside you. See, when, when we play, and you were here, you, you were with us through sound check and all. I mean, but, but, you know, we play in a, in a tuning called 432. I don't play in 440. 
I play for sound. I don't play for flash. I play for sound. And, and 440 hertz, you know, and 432 is, 432 is, is more in the speed of light realm. And you'd be amazed how velvety it feels. You heard it just there, how it went to that sound. <clears throat> well, this is the way it's put together in the earth. Now, I don't know if you know, but the glory is in here now. Now, I want you to really stay with me for a few minutes, and we're going to go somewhere. Amen. Amen. Now, before Adam was ever created, there was certain levels of authority, only certain levels of authority, four. And the way God put the, the earth together, the Bible said the archangel shouted for joy when he laid the foundations. He put it together. There was sound. That's why it's recorded. And he said, let there be. He said, and it was. He said, and it was. Things, the scripture talks about one archangel that was anointed, one cherub, we should say. His name was Lucifer. He was anointed with a prophetic anointing. Scripture talks about in Ezekiel 28 that he walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. What that is, is it's revelations of God. It's revelations that God has and he would walk up and down. He would go into heaven and walk up and down in these stones of fire. And when a bright fire would appear, it would shine up. It was a revelation of God. He would pick that revelation up. And he was a living instrument. The scripture says that he had, he had pipes that was built into his being, his body. Instead of a heart, he didn't have a human heart. He had timbrels made into his body person and he was a cherub so he had a wingspan and when he would and in those days there was a crystalline canopy that went all the way around the earth it was thin metallic plates the ancient rabbis knew about it for for a couple thousand years they they knew about this thing science is just now discovering it in modern times and in those days, it kept the earth a perfect paradise. It only let in so much ultraviolet rays. It, 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 everything, ferns would grow 200 feet in the air. And God created creatures that could reach up and eat them. A man could run 200 miles and not be winded. And if you cut him with something deep, if you could get to his flesh... It would heal over in just a few moments because he assimilated, uh, assimilated three times the oxygen we do now. And so the earth was put together for you to live forever. It's real quiet in here, but maybe we'll shout in a minute. So he, he <laughs> and so this archangel or this cherub, I keep saying, this cherub would, he would walk up and down in the stones of fire and he would find this revelation and he would take this revelation and lift himself up to the center of the earth and he would begin to sing the revelation. The timbrels would beat, the shofars would blow and he would lift himself up and those metallic plates, the sound would hit it and science says it would go all the way around the earth and everything in the earth could hear the music. And when he would sing that revelation of the Almighty, the earth would begin to move and adjust itself for what was coming. One day he's walking up and down in the stones of fire. And he finds this bright revelation and he picks it up. And when he takes it to himself, he discovered something that filled him with rage it was the revelation of a man. 
And Psalm 8 records this. Psalm 8, when you look at it, you begin to understand something. You know, it's not enough that we just get up on stage, take a few moments, and run off stage. We need to know what's going on and where we are in history and where we are in the prophetic realm and what's happening right this moment and who's doing what and why are they doing it. So he went before the throne of God in Psalm 8. And what you're reading in Psalm 8 is you're actually reading a court case that he brought into the courts of heaven. You can read the same psalm, you can read the same account in Hebrews 2, except in Hebrews 2 it says there was an angel speaking. And if you really look into the Greek, it says he was earnestly protesting. When he found the revelation of the man, he came before the Lord in the court of heaven. The Lord all capitals in the King James, in the authorized King James, is not God's person. It's God in his government. Elohim, big G, little O, little D, is triune God. But capital L-O-R-D is God in his government, rendering harvest. And so he comes into the court and he says, O oh Lord, our master, O oh Jehovah, O oh Yahweh, our Adon, our master, how excellent is your name or your authority in all the earth. He opens the courtroom. How excellent is your name in all the earth. Who has set your glory above the heavens? Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings hast thou ordained strength because of thine enemies, that thou mightest still the enemy and the avenger. He said, out of the mouth of a babe and a suckling, he found all of this in the revelation. By the time a baby can, can, can cry, there's something on the inside of it that can stop the enemy in his tracks. That's why he must kill them before they can ever cry. And he said, Listen to what he said. Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings hast thou ordained. But in the New Testament, Jesus translated it praise. So a baby can praise God by the time it can cry. By the time it can suck the breast, it can praise God. He said that you might steal the enemy and the avenger, the bad harvest, because he understood the court. He said, when I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and stars which thou hast ordained, what is man? He had never seen this creature. What is this thing? He said, what is man that you're mindful of him, that you have him in your mind, O oh great God? What is man that everything is made for him? He said, what is man that you're mindful of him or the son of man? Are there children that you would visit them? What is this creature that you would walk with and talk with? Because the Almighty, the person, Elohim, didn't walk and talk with angels. But here's a creature he would. And he said, what is he? that you're mindful of him, or the son of man, that you would visit him. For you made him a little lower than the angels. But that word angels is the word for God. So you made him a little lower than you. He said you made him a little lower than you, and you crowned him with glory and honor. You made him to have dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, yea, and the beast of the field, and the fowl of the air, and the fish of the sea, and whatsoever passeth through the paths of the jet streams of the seas. O Yahweh, our master, 
how excellent is your name in all the earth. And he bowed out of the courtroom. Don't you know on that day that every other angel stood wide-eyed that Lucifer would dare come in and challenge the Almighty, come in and even question why he made this man, who was this man that was coming, and he knew he was going to have to sing the song. And he didn't want to sing this song because the earth would prepare itself for him to come. So the day came when all around the earth they gathered to hear the song of the Lord, the prophetic song of the Lord. In Isaiah 14, the song of the Lord came. And it was time, and everyone was going to hear the song of the man, the man who could ascend into heaven, the man who could, who could have his throne above the stars. Stars, the angels. The man who we just read had dominion over the sun, the moon, and the stars. So he must sing the song in Isaiah 14. Isaiah asked the question in verse 12, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, light bearer, son of the morning? Jesus is called the bright and morning star. Here is the son of the morning. He was Jesus' personal angel. That's why he had to do battle with him on the Mount of Temptation because a man rises or falls to his own master. And so he's Isaiah, the prophet. I love Isaiah. Isaiah is the, is, oh, I love Isaiah. Isaiah is the prophet who asks questions. Isaiah is the prophet who's not, who was never a timid to think and let God show him something. He's the one that said, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. He said, how art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? Think about this. How art thou fallen to the ground? How, how art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? For you said in your heart, instead of singing the song for the man, he turned it on himself. And he said, I will ascend into the heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like in the image and likeness of the Most High. He wants to be a man. He wanted that position, and where it says, the, uh, my throne above the stars of God, when you start reading it in the Hebrew translations, it start, the words start coming out, and it says something like this, I will have a back, eyebrows, and hide. He wanted to be the man, and he sang the song that day into the earth. And it went all around the earth. And while all the creatures and the inhabitants stood rocking, waiting to hear the prophetic sweet voice of the Lord, the song that would bring the next thing into being, and suddenly he starts singing, I will. And it turned dark. And everything began to get dark. And the sound and the creatures probably began to move back into the sh shelters of wherever they could go. And what he did was at that moment in time, he sowed a seed into the earth, a seed of hybrid nature, because he can't be a man 
neither can he possess one. He has a body. Disembodied spirits possess men, not fallen angels. We go over to Genesis 3. Watch this in Genesis 3. Right after man had fallen, right after Adam had fallen, listen what he says. Verse 15. It's the first prophecy after the fall that we can clearly see that Jesus was coming. And the Lord God said, and I'm talking now, listen what he's saying to the serpent. He says, and I will put enmity or war between you and the woman, between thy seed and her seed, and it, her seed, shall bruise thy seed's head, and your seed will bruise her seed's heel. Speaking of the crucifixion. But did you notice something about that? God just said the seed of the serpent, the seed of the woman, and he didn't check up. He talked like everybody there knew what he was talking about. Did you notice that? He mentioned the seed of the serpent. Where is it mentioned before? He talked about something that everyone there listening understood. And he didn't apologize to you for it either. He didn't ask you, did you think it was too deep? He just put it out there because the serpent, the woman, the man, everyone there, including himself, knew what he was talking about. What seed? He revealed the war and the motive to the very end. It was when Lucifer sang that song and sowed the seed of the serpent into the earth, that there has to come a time when he has eyebrows back and hide flesh-covered crimson. And this is why you see, and, and the Lord God came boldly on the scene and said, her seed will crush your seed's head. <clears throat> that has been the war since that time. It's what imploded the war, the world before Adam. It's what, it's the war to this day. The seed of the serpent. So in Genesis 6, you find a hybrid race of people. Giants came into being. Genesis 6 talks about it. You don't need the book of Enoch to tell you about it. It's in Genesis 6. As they begin, if you start looking the words up in Hebrew, you'll find how they begin to cross, cross bloodlines, bloodstreams, do experiments. They were in touch with that fallen world. And it, was, it had a right now uh, to bring a hybrid seed into the earth. But every time it did, it would disrupt the atmosphere until it got so big a flood was coming, a worldwide flood. Well, maybe you don't want to hear this. Maybe we need to be doing something else tonight. I'm trying to tell you something from the eyes, from the viewpoint of a prophet to see and hear things maybe in a way you haven't heard them because in the prophetic scheme of things, you're about to find out where you are. So he, he moves into this realm and he begins to create these giant hybrids and every time it tore the atmosphere until the earth couldn't take it anymore. 
Now you know what he did in the first world. Go to Jeremiah 4. We need to look at that. We can't go any probably any further without seeing that. The Lord said, see that, so let's see that. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> Jeremiah 4, look at about verse 23, 20, yeah, 23. Jeremiah, being a prophet, could look forward in time and behind him in time. He said these words, I beheld the earth, and lo, it was without form and void. Whoa. You know where he's talking about now. When God created the earth, Isaiah 45 says, he did, in chapter 45 said he didn't create the earth without form and void. He created it to be inhabited. Something happened and it became without form and void. It was when that song was sang. And so time passed between the first three verses of Genesis. He created in the beginning, God created. Isaiah 40 said he, he calculated the water in the hollow of his hand, all the moisture of the earth. Said he meted out the heavens with a span. And the Hebrews talks about a nine-inch span from the tip of his little finger to the tip of his thumb. He measured it out, and, and a nine-inch span, my span like this is almost, almost nine inches. So now you have an idea of how big God's hand is. He's not something you won't recognize. You're in his image and his likeness. And so he meted out the heavens with a span, and he said he weighed out the, the, the hills in a balance took little hills and put them in a balance. He said the nations were as a drop of, uh, in the bucket of that dust and that balance. The balance is capital L-O-R-D, government. Seed, plant, harvest. That's the cardinal government of everything. Oh, yes, it is. Yes, it is. Everything you ate today came through that government. All your clothes came through that government. I got a shocker for you. You came through the government. Oh, yes, you did, too. The government of God, yes, you did. You were all seeds. You got planted, and you grew up. And if you're going to have any children, it's going to be done the same way. You can't identify as an attack Apache, Apache helicopter and expect to reproduce. There's only two genders. Get over it. My God. Can't you see people? People, they, they start identifying with a moose. They're going to identify as a helicopter. Next thing you know, you're running around. And, and then you look like an idiot. This is where we are in time, huh? I mean, really? Well, I'm going to tell you something. You can powder up, paint up, and all this kind of stuff. You can, you can wear wigs. You can, you, can be the, you, can, you can do whatever you think you need to do. And you can have all kinds of operations, but 100 years from now, if somebody dug you up out of that dirt, a scientist would look right at you and say, that's a woman right there. That's a man right there. <laughs> yes, it would. Oh, yes, it would. Because you ain't changed anything. I'm going to tell you something. Satan wanted your position bad enough. He said, I will have eyebrows back and hide. But he, every time he tried to inhabit a man, it would disrupt the atmosphere because he's one species and you're another. And your loved one didn't turn into an angel when they went to heaven either. 
They did not. They don't come, they didn't take a lower position. They're created in the image and likeness of God, and that's what they are today. They're his family. Yeah, I will, Lord. Let me, I want to tell you something, and I'm going to tell you something. Yes, 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 I'll tell it. I'll tell it anyway. Hell wishes I wouldn't tell it. But the Lord wants, to, wants it told. And I listen to him, and I don't listen to punk angels. <clears throat> now, here is the thing. Let me tell you something. One of these days, one of these days, you're going to stand. You ought to ask for it. Stand with the Lord in heaven. Look out over the lake of fire. When he takes Satan and like a mashed, dried out cow patty. <laughs> he, and when he lands out there somewhere in a bright spot goes you'll know what that happened to him right there. An angel is an angel, but a man, something else. Look at Genesis chapter 1. We're on a journey tonight. I told you through the scriptures is where we're going. Have we, have we not been traveling through the scriptures? Yeah, Brother Robin don't use any Bible when he preaches. Really? <laughs> really? Well, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I usually do. As many as I can stick in there. Genesis chapter 1, watch this. You got to see this. Verse 11 and God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth. And it was so. And the earth brought forth grass and herb yielding seed uh, after his kind, and, and the tree yielding fruit whose seed was in itself. See that? After his kind. Now listen to this. And God saw that it was good, and the evening and the morning were the third day. Not the singing group, it was something else here. <laughs> Even though they're very good, very good. And I like them. I like Max Boys. I like that. You know, he's got that. Man, he's just good. Well, anyway. I can't do that like he can. But anyway, I want you to notice this. On the third day, everything that had seed within itself was planted. No, wait a minute now. Everything that had seed within itself was planted. Now, somewhere Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 has to reconcile. Because Genesis 1 is the creation, this and that, and it goes on to day 6 and talks about the man. But in Genesis 2, it says he watered the face of the earth and, and, and made the man's body and so forth. It's talking about the same account, but how it happened. On day 3, see, the Scripture, you know where the Scripture talks about? It said there was a river came out of paradise and, and watered the garden, and from thence it was broke into four heads. One guy remembers that. <laughs> I'm picking at you, you know I am. Just play with me. <clears throat> so it broke into four heads. Well, when you study that out and you start looking at the Hebrew wording of that and what those words actually mean, you start discovering words like this. <clears throat> that water, it, it flowed like uh, underground rivers, but it was full of light. It was light carrying a revelation of God. I imagine that. <clears throat> and a mist would come up out of the earth full of the revelation of God. 
And in those days, sin wasn't here. And so in those days, the topsoil would have been about six, seven feet. And so when that mist came up out of the earth and the glory began to cover the earth, on day three, God came down into that glory and he laid down underneath that wet earth and cast his image. He made a cast of his image. See, I watched, I watched a man, I got curious about that when I was studying that, so I went to look up a cast, how it's made. And it showed this guy took a bucket and he filled it full of this plaster. And he took a, had a couple do, join their hands and stick it in that bucket. And it kind of got rubbery. And then he said, take your hands out now. They took it out and there was a little hole in the top. So he mixed up this pink substance and poured it in that hole. Then he let it dry. When it all dried, he turned the bucket over and pulled the bucket off. And there was an image of a bucket. But then, <laughs> So then he turned the bucket back over and where the little pink hole was, the master sculptor knew what that was. So he took his hands and began to pull the plaster away from that pink. And as it went down and the debris fell away, it began to show the arms, the hands, the perfect image of that couple's hands like that. And it was a cast of their hands. When God laid down in that wet earth and cast his own image, he would have laid like this. And he laid down underneath that topsoil. No angel could see it because a mist covered the ground. This was a mystery hidden in God. Scripture talks about that. And it, he lay down under that wet topsoil. And this was on day three. And when he came back up out of that ground, he filled that cast with his faith. Now watch this. That was day three. On day six, three days and nights later, <laughs> he went back to that spot and began to uncover the ground. And he opened about a six-foot grave. And there lay the man. And just like Elijah and Elisha, that's who they learned it from. He spread himself up on that man. The Hebrew says he shadowed the man. That means he laid down on top of him and put his eyes on his eyes and his mouth on his mouth and his hands on his hands. And it was an exact duplicate. He was not making a man. He was reproducing himself. So he was reproducing himself. He wanted a family. And by laying down on top of the man, he was showing the only thing above him is me. And he's the only thing big enough to meet his need. And so he inhaled and caught up the man's spirit in his breath. And he exhaled and breathed into his nostrils the breath of lives. The Hebrew says lives. And the man's soul became alive. And he raised him up out of that grave and stood him there. And the first making of the man was a prophetic utterance of the Almighty. God is prophetic. And he said this to begin with. What he was showing you was one day. He wasn't just showing you that you would have a resurrection. That was there. That was evident. He showed that. But he also was showing that one day I will take the form of a man and die and be buried three days and nights. And after three days and nights, I will rise again. 
It was a prophetic. And man, man was created to be a prophetic being. And the earth, the whole earth, the Bible didn't just say he watered that spot. He said he watered the face of the earth, the face of the ground. So the whole earth, when God laid down in it, the earth shocked itself and said, remembered that event. It remembered that. You had noticed your dirt has memory. Even when I can't really hear what I'm playing, if the sound is not together and I can't hear what I'm playing, my hands have memory. And I can close my eyes and still play. My hands remember where, where to go. My dirt remembers. And the dirt remembered that event. And what happened, now watch this close. The day would come, the earth remembered. Deep down in the earth, the, the man's environment came up with him. And when the, when the earth, when if you'd have seen the trees and the plants and all, you would have said the earth is smiling. But deep down in it was a potential mourn and a groan that the Almighty would die one day if the man chose the wrong path. God loved him so he put his redemption, he swore an oath that day, I will take flesh and die if necessary. And, I, and redemption was sown into the creation. So the Almighty loved the man so much, he put the decision of when he would do that. It would begin if the man chose wrong. So he put it in the hands of the man's decision. How can he do more than give you his life? I guess that's a little heavy, but but when you start, when you stop and you start thinking of this, no wonder Lucifer said, I want eyebrows back and flesh covered crimson. I won't hide. But he couldn't have that. So he began to develop these hybrid races. And it got so bad every time one would happen. It, it's not natural, it's hybrid. The earth suddenly started reacting violently. And when it came down to, there was only eight left. The Lord said, the Lord, all capitals, said the end of all flesh has come up before me. It's time for its harvest. And he told Noah, he said, only in you have I found righteous. And he said, Noah, he said, he found grace in the eyes of the capital L-O-R-D. How would he find grace? Well, well now, how would he find it? Well, redemption was sown in the earth from the beginning. Somehow he tapped into that. How would he do that? Genesis 5. Genesis 5 said, Adam begot Seth. Seth begot Enos. Enos begot uh, Kaanan. Kaanan begot Mahalalel. And it goes all the way down to Noah. When you take those names and translate them in Hebrew, it says something like this. For man, will come a substituted mortal. The great God will come down out of heaven teaching and at his death will bring the despairing rest. 
That's the genealogy of Genesis 5. And they knew those names. And that's the gospel God preached aforetime to Abraham. So they knew the gospel. And they knew the Messiah would come because it was sown. They knew this. That's why there's so much mentioned about the third day through the scripture. Prophets like Isaiah came into Hezekiah and said, and you know, you know, what's the difference in a prophet in the Old Testament and the New? Grace. They still act the same way. But I don't even believe there's a prophet. Shh. And so Isaiah went into Hezekiah. You know what he told him? Get your house in order. For thus saith the Lord, you shall surely, surely die. He turns and walks out of the room. And Hezekiah turns his face to the wall. And he said, Lord, remember my righteousness. Remember what I've done right, not what I've done wrong. Isaiah's headed out through the garden. And the Lord says, go back. So Isaiah walked in and he said, thus saith the Lord, you have 15 more years. He walked in the first time an Old Testament prophet ran into grace in the garden and came back and gave him a New Testament, a New Testament pronouncement. So the, the seed of the serpent is what they fight to bring into being. I don't know how late it is, but it's later than we probably think right now. I want you to, I want you to, to, to focus your, your spiritual prowess that God has given you as a believer. See, every believer has a prophetic anointing in them. I didn't say every believer was a prophet. I said they have a prophetic anointing, but you are the prophet of your own life. Oh, yeah. Whatever you start talking is where you'll go. And so you are the prophet of your own life. You have an anointing of a king and a priest in you. But the mantle of a prophet is something different. And people confuse prophecy with the mantle of a prophet. A prophet is an agent of the court of heaven. A prophet comes into the earth when there's no higher place to appeal. And men are under tyranny so hard they can't, no one's listening. And they can't break through the top echelon of their government. And they're being treated like under tyranny from tyrants. And so they start saying this. People will say, we appeal to heaven. And when they appeal to heaven, the Lord sends a prophet. And the prophet comes into the face of the king. And says, thus saith the Lord. Nathan came to David. Told him the story of the sheep. Remember all of that? David, being a shepherd, got infuriated. He said, the man should die. He'll die. I'll pronounce sentence on him. And Nathan, standing in the court of the king, said, Thou art the man. In other words, the Lord sent Nathan into the earthly court to bring the heavenly court of Jehovah so that the Lord could try him there. 
And David pronounced his own judgment. That's one of the roles of a prophet. One day when the Antichrist has his widest expression of power, and he's, he's ruling in such a, such a place, there's two prophets withstand him. I mean, there's, there's two, just two. All the armies couldn't defeat him, but two prophets stand him and stand in front of him. And they look, and the Bible says, whoever tries to stop them, he said they have power to, to speak to the weather at will. And he said, whoever tries to stop them. Fire comes out of their mouth and consumes them. It's talking about prophetic words. Well, can you imagine? And the beast says, stop them. And they reach to stop them and they go, and just they're just burnt spots all over the ground, man. <laughs> well, you'd never confuse prophecy or the nine gifts of the Spirit where one of them is prophecy. Don't confuse that with the mantle of a prophet. It's different. It's way different. I stand before you tonight a prophet of God with the mantle of one. Not because a man gave it to me. One night I was in the mountains. I was on a high mountain staying the night. Robin, my family, we were just on vacation a couple of days. And we changed rooms with one of our children because her children were little and they were going to have to sleep with her in this big bed. So we went up to the highest room and just stayed in a little bedroom. And so I'm laying there in the bed in the middle of the night. And as the morning hours started approaching, now we're high up. You can just see out through. And once you could see one cabin on a mountain as high as you, and that's about it. And the Lord came by that room. And I'll never forget it. And he carried me down a hallway. And in this, walking down this hallway, on my right it was dark. On my left was stone arches like that with a stone top on the arches. Torches of fire with cages around the fire was between the arches. And I'm walking down through there. I can still see it. I could describe things to you. I could tell you what was in the hallway. And as I'm walking down through there, I heard these voices back here behind me somewhere. It sounded demonic. So I just stopped. I had asked the Lord when I seen the hallway, and I knew he's leading me down the hallway. I said, what is this? He said, this is where prophets go to be anointed. And I said, I heard those voices, so I stopped. I thought, am I being deceived? And when I turned back around like that, and the Lord said, do you want this or not? I said, yea, Lord. And I followed. That wasn't... It was a visitation. It was an encounter that I have no words to tell you how that happened. But all my life I had saw and would see the future and see things that people thought I was lying or crazy when I was four years old. And I would walk in the future over and over and over again. And then that experience and the Lord told me what I was. 
not a man. And it's amazing to me how men want to judge something like that. They wasn't in the hall. I didn't see them there. Maybe they went down it. I don't know. But I know what I saw. I didn't want to tell you that. That's a precious event to me. That happened. It was very precious and very solemn to me. And for a long time, I couldn't tell it. Well, I don't know if I believe it. I really don't give a rip. Whether you do or you don't. I'm trying to be a little, I'm trying to be transparent and tell you something. And the Lord will show me events from time to time to come. I'll tell the event and it happens. And it makes some people so mad it just chaps their behind. Till one called the office one day when I, I gave that word about that ship. Wasn't it about that ship that got stuck in the Suez Canal? I gave that word before it happened and then gave it the day it happened. They called and said, what, what, uh, doggone him. That was their words. Call the office. Doggone him. He don't let anybody in there during the 11th hour. He said, what's he got? A bunch of equipment in the back room where he can see around the world, I think that's what they think I have. I didn't have the money at that time to see around the block, much less around the world. I'm very serious. Oh, if we had more time. We, we really don't tonight. But if we had more time. I'm, I've, got, I've, I've got two or three different paths running through my spirit and my thinking right now. And the most important one is the one we have to travel. Until the next time we meet. We, I can tell you this, I love you with everything in me, and I cannot stand to see you oppressed and hurt. I can't stand to see tyranny push on you. I don't like to see the Word of God taken from you. I want to see you win and win huge. I want you to win so big that nothing can deny the power of God is in your life, working in your life. I want you to prosper. I want your children to prosper. I want to see you be everything God has for you. And I mean that. My partners are the most precious thing to me. I carry their names with me everywhere and now they have to be updated because I have prayed so much I almost destroyed the flash drive over them. But they pray for me too. And I want to tell you something. So the seed of the serpent is what all of this is about. That's what it's about. And the strange sickness that roared through the earth now has been discovered it has the same components as snake venom. Seed of the serpent. If we had more time. But I have to tell you, I have to tell you what the Lord wants you to hear. You have been, you have been raised up in this time. You're combating powers that you know not of. You're combating things that he just won't let me tell you right now. 
but you are fighting things that, that only you can beat. L listen to what I'm going to tell you. When forward motion is stopped and going forward into the future is stopped, what's behind that is where tyranny springs from. Don't ever forget that. The body of Christ was lulled into stopping. A great prophecy was fulfilled in 1975 and really came into being in the 1990s. We saw it then. In the 1990s, we had powerful, you know, and remember in the book of Re Revelation when, when John is standing there and he said, I heard a voice as a trumpet behind me. He said, I turned to see the voice as a trumpet, music. He said, I, I heard this music talking to me. And he recognized the voice. And he turned to look, and when he did, he saw seven golden candlesticks, and he begins to describe what he saw. But the music he heard, and he went to a, a higher place. He went in deeper. In the 1990s, we had, we had music like Carmen. who began to show us there was more depth in God. He did the first concept videos in Christian music we knew of, Satan bite the dust. Uh, uh, um, remember what, what was the other one about the resurrection? Champion, the champion. And he start, he, he done all of these just the, so powerful A to J. Remember, and he brought up DC Talk and all this. I mean, all this stuff was happening. And then he teamed up with Petra. Petra was playing, bow, bow, bow. Our turn now. Something's going to change. And then they started, Petra was singing about, we're going to a, a higher place beyond belief, beyond belief. We're about to go into a higher place, a higher place, a higher place. And it was ready in the 90s. It was ready for you and I to walk on in to the seven golden candlesticks. But then something happened. Seeker Friendly was born. And Willow Creek happened. And we hanged our harps on a willow. And the only thing we could sing was songs with water references. And it mellowed it down. And victory was gone. We don't want to offend people. So don't let people give messages in tongues. Don't let them operate in the nine gifts of the Spirit. Heaven is not pleased with this. I didn't say people were evil. I said that kind of thing. But we hanged our harps on a willow. And the scripture said when they hanged their harps on a willow, they went into captivity. And said, how can we sing the songs of the Lord in a strange land? And it began, it began to make the church so anemic, so weak in its constitution, that a sickness was sent into the earth. And a satanic, if I had time to tell you, I could tell you when they opened the gate of hell and let it in. There was a satanic ritual that was done to bring that in this earth. There was DNA collected for 10 or 15 years to find out how many people it would affect. People lined up to give their DNA. For 15 years. And they discovered it would it would affect less than 2% of the people, kill less than one. 
but it was enough to scare the hell out of everybody. But it didn't scare the hell out of them. It put the fear of hell in them. And the church was too weak. And when, when the government said, shut it down, the church said, yes, sir, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Just locked it up. Now, I want to ask you a question. Could you see Jesus and somebody with that sickness come walking up and Peter said, you know what he's got, don't you? You know what he's got, don't you? You know what he's got, don't you, Jesus? And Jesus say, Peter, take his temperature before you let him in. Take your temperature before you come to the power of God to get healed. If you didn't have a temperature, you wouldn't have come to church to get healed. But the church couldn't stand. They were, they were too busy singing about water. They had no drive to their music. They had no victory in their sound. So they just did whatever the government told them to do. And now you'd think that would be plenty, plenty, right? Oh, we could stop this, right? Right? Well, then they start arresting pastors. But the church don't complain. They turned each other in. Turned each other in. Now you tell me how that would have flown in Jesus' time. Tell me what do you think he thought about that? The person with leprosy, which was a death sentence, came up to him. You know what they said to him? You can make me clean if you will. He didn't know if he wanted to lay his hands on that or not. Jesus looked at him and said, you know what one translation says he said to him? Why, sure I will. And he put his hands on that rotting flesh. I've laid my hands on that sickness that came into the earth till the sweat was so thick it felt like syrup. I wish I had time to tell you where, where it came from. But tonight the Lord wants me to take you somewhere else because I'm about to have to close tonight now. We, so we, have, we, we deal in a, in a weak church I'm not talking about this church. I'm just talking about as a whole. The majority became so weak and decrepit and anemic that we had no power. We had no power. We couldn't do anything for people. They didn't know where to turn. So, There now has to be, how is this going to happen? What are we going to do? Well, I tell you what now, one day God's going to come into this planet. <laughs> Jesus is going to show up one of these first days and he's going to burn the butt of everybody that tried to hold him back. Glory, we're going to be all ready to go. I thought he was in the earth. In you. Now, I want you to see this. Lord, you, uh, what do you want me to do right here? I, I can jump. I can, what, what do you want me to do right here on this thing? I, I want to do whatever you want me to do, sir. 
okay, I'll do, I'll do this and then this and then we'll close. You don't know what this is, but <laughs> let's move in this and this. Because I didn't know where I was going either when I started. I didn't know where the music was going when I started. But I knew when we hit that sound. Didn't you? Didn't you know when we hit that sound? Aren't you glad we didn't quit till we hit it? I'm talking about all of us. We didn't quit till we hit it. When we hit it, man, there was power. Now, see, the fog in here is kind of thick now because the glory's here. Let me just say this to you. When Jesus was 12 years old, he goes to Jerusalem with his parents. You know, go, they're going into, you know the story. So he goes to Jerusalem. Now, you said take your time. And now, okay, well, don't look bored. <laughs> you, know, you don't want to look bored now because... Okay, don't look bored. Don't look bored. Okay, Jesus goes to Jerusalem. You know, and then there, there's such a crowd, and then his, uh, uh, Joseph and Mary, his mother and Joseph, they leave and they go back, and they, they miss him three days. Well, that's, that's prophetic. It said three days later, they found him in the temple. Prophetic. Three days later, he was in the temple. You get it. Some of you are getting it right now. So he, he goes back. They find him. Watch what he says. He said, Joseph said, didn't you know your mother and I would be seeking you? Or, or she said, didn't you know your father and I would be seeking you sorrowing? He said, didn't you know I must be about my father's business? And then it says this, he went with them and made himself subject to them. In other words, he knew who he was. And so he, he made himself subject to them. And it said he grew in wisdom and stature and favor with God and man. So Jesus didn't just come here with a poof ministry. You know, just walk along, poof, there it was, poof, there it was, poof, there it was. He didn't do that. He, he, was, he laid aside his robes as God, even though he's God in the flesh. But he laid aside that power in heaven and robed himself in flesh and became a prophet under the Abrahamic covenant. Even though he's God in the flesh. So he had to learn it legally by revelation knowledge. So he had to learn it and grow up in that. And he grew in wisdom and stature and favor with God and man. And he grows and he grows and he grows. Then he comes to the River Jordan. So we, it goes that far ahead, just that quick. John's baptizing. Oh, John. That no church in this, in this maybe this one and, my, and the one we go to would have ever let John preach. <laughs> I mean, could you see him in some of the cathedrals of today wearing camel's hair? Wild hair on his head. And he'd come in and they say, now John, we need you to be a little bit gentle. Because there's going to be a lot of pastors here today. A lot of the five-fold ministries come in to hear you speak. You need to be real gentle. Okay. You generation of vipers. <laughs> Your mamas were snakes. Do deeds meet for repentance? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, he's out baptizing. And you know, they say he had a, you know, they ask him, are you Elijah? Are 
you are, who are you? The reason they asked him, was he Elijah? There is a, a story that's told among the Jews that uh, are among the ancient teachers, I should say, that, you know, Zechariah was actually the one in line to be the high priest, not Annas and Caiaphas. They, they wasn't even legitimate priests. They were appointed by Rome. I mean, you're talking about a Sadducee. They didn't believe in angels, resurrection, nothing like that. They were so sad, you see. They were. And so they believed in nothing powerful. And they weren't even supposed to be there. I think one was an Edomite. They weren't even supposed to be in there. Zechariah was the next high priest. So John the Baptist was the last legitimate Old Testament high priest. And they say that they kept the girdle of Elijah behind the altar, and that was Zechariah's job, was to go in there, and he gave that to John. That's why they looked at that girdle and said, are you Elijah? He said, no. Don't you know when they looked at him and said, are, are, you, are, are you the one? Are you the Christ? Are you, are you the one that's coming? John knew who he was, but I, I don't know. Maybe John went. And they're all doing this. Because the devil wants to know who. He didn't know who Jesus was or he had just killed Mary. He was waiting to see. John said, no. He said, but he's coming after me. Whose shoes I'm not worthy to unloose. And the devil heard shoes, feet, crush, head, mind. He, he's... He's, I mean, he, you know, he's, he's had it. He knows it. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Woo. So he, so he's, he says, you know, he's coming after me. So they waited to see he was coming. And the day came. Here he came down the shores of the Jordan to where the Gihon waters spill out into the Jordan where they were washing the lambs. And he walks up and John says, he said, baptize me, John. John said, uh-uh, mm-mm, mm-mm. Why wouldn't John baptize him? Because John was baptizing for repentance. Jesus had no sin. And so John said, you need to baptize me. And he said this. I'm going to put it in words now that we can get this because we're about to have to go. I've held you too long. That guy in that black coat held me a long time. <laughs> I didn't hold you. That's an exit back there. You could have left. You could have left any time you wanted to. It ain't locked. Anyway, he says, um, John, I'm not being baptized. This is paraphrasing. John, I'm not being baptized for the remission of sin. He said, I'm being baptized to fulfill all righteousness. So what is he talking about? It says, unto all righteousness. What is he talking about? He's talking about this. He's talking about this, is, this baptism is going to be a sign of my consecration of a quality decision from which there is no return. When you baptize me today, I am vowing before God and man. I'm vowing before my Father that I am going to do whatever it takes to put it back right again. It makes no difference what it takes. I'm going to put it back right again. And then it said John permitted him to come. And when he baptized him, he came up out of the water. And he said when he did, the heavens opened. And the Greeks talks about it went all the way through the nether world to the throne of God. And Jesus and his father looked at each other. And the Holy Ghost descended on him bodily like a dove. And the voice from heaven came and said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Well, he already knew God was his father, but this is something else. When he made that consecration, he's saying this is the last Adam. 
<laughs> this is the one. So the Bible said he goes into the wilderness, led of the Spirit, into the wilderness. <laughs> the scripture says, to be tempted of the devil. God never led anybody to be tempted of the devil. Remember the prayer, lead us not into temptation. The word wilderness there is the Hebrew word to speak. He was being led of the Spirit into the wilderness to fast and pray and hear his father speak. Speak about what? What he just heard and what it was going to take to put it right. <clears throat> so he goes into the wilderness, he fasts and he prays. And at the end of 40 days, he knows. And he has it. Then Satan comes. When he got hungry again, Satan shows up for the flesh. Uh, if you're the son of God, let me see you do something that only I've ever seen another son of God do. It was a temptation. That means it was possible. Command the stones to be made bread. He said, man will not live by bread alone, but by every word. It's written, man will not. It's written, man will not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. In other words, you're one word behind God all the time. All the time. You're one word behind him. He's there, and you can hear every word he speaks. So he's talking. You know where he's talking from? Your tomorrow. Why? Because God speaks from the place of no sin. There's only one place in your life where there is no sin. That's in your tomorrow. Because you haven't gotten there yet to mess that up. So tomorrow is clean. So God lives in your future and your tomorrow and he speaks to you from your future. And if you'll turn and eat the words from your future, then you can bring the future into today and live today like you're in tomorrow. That's all prophetic stuff. Now I, gotta, I just got to fast forward. There's a lot we could teach right here, but we don't have the time. So he comes back down off the mountain. We're just going to go with that right now. So he comes back down off the mountain. And when he comes, the Bible said he returned in the power of the Spirit. So he comes back in the power of the Spirit. Now remember, he's growing in stature, wisdom and stature and favor with God and man. So he comes back down off the mountain. And when he comes off the mountain... He goes to the wedding at Cana. Now watch what happens. He come back saying, repent, repent. So he comes back down. He goes, he's invited to the wedding at Cana. The mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and his disciples were called there. So he goes there, and his mother said they have no wine. Well, there's a lot of reasons that, you know, it was probably one of his half-sisters marrying that day. So he's, he said, what about to do with you? My hour has not yet come. She said, whatever the servant, whatever he says to you servants, you do. Now, why would he say that? What about to do with thee? My hour's not yet come. He wanted Mary to put a demand on that power. So Mary put action to it and said, whatever he says, you do. That pulled that from him. So he goes to the, the six water pots that held the ashes of the red heifer, which is symbolic of himself and all his cleansing, but he fills it up to the brim. They fill it up to the brim. And the servants, he said, now draw out of there and take it to the governor of the feast. And somewhere between there, when the governor drank it, it was wine. The best wine. Here's something for you to know. Everybody there got to drink the wine, but only the servants got to handle the miracle. <laughs> Need to remember that. Everybody got to taste, taste the miracle. 
But only the servants got to handle it and knew the inside scoop on that. Servants have that privilege. So here it is. I've got to move fast now. So the first thing he faces is his own mind against the elements. Satan tried to get him to do that with stones. He said, no. Why? Because I, I only do what I hear my father say. I only, do, I only do what I see him do. He said, I live by every word that comes out of his mouth, not yours. And so he goes right to the water, turns it to wine because his father told him to do it. Now you see what Satan's plan was. If he could have got him to use his power at his word. So he turns the water to wine. No mind but his own. Him and the element. He has to believe his identity. And if he'll believe who he is right here, he's about to walk on the next step of destiny. What is that? The next time you see him dealing with water, he's calming winds and waves. The next time you see him dealing with it, he's walking across it. One is an ascension over the other. He's growing in wisdom and stature and favor. Then he starts in on his healing ministry. He heals Peter's mother-in-law's fever. Then he heals rotting flesh, leprosy. Then he spits on the ground and creates eyes. One's an ascension over another. Then he goes into the ministry of defeating death. He heals and raises the dead, been dead a few minutes. Jay Iris' daughter. Then he goes to Nain and raises the widow's son, who's been dead a few hours. Then he goes to the tomb of Lazarus, who's been dead four days. So here he's, one's his ascension over the other. And then he looks at his men one day and he starts talking about something very strange. He said, who do men say that I, the son of man, am? They said, some say you're John the Baptist. Why? He talked like him. They had the same, he was a prophet. Some say you're Jeremiah. He acted like Jeremiah. Some say you're Elijah or one of the prophets. Jesus said, who do you say I am? That's the only thing that really matters. And Peter said, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. <laughs> don't you know? Don't you know? Peter ain't born again. Nobody was born again till Jesus rose from the dead. And don't you know how that revelation hit him? How does it hit you when you get one? Oh. <gasps> Oh, oh, look at that, look at that. Well, imagine if you wasn't even born again and, and God spoke to you. Peter probably just, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. <laughs> he, don't, he don't know what to do. He like Thumper the rabbit, you know, he don't know what to do. Why don't you listen to what he told them then? He said, then he began to tell them what, how he was going to Jerusalem would suffer many things of the priest and so forth. Now the, Ro uh, the Romans nailed him to the cross, but it said he suffered from the hands of the priest and the scribes and so forth. And so he, he went, and when he said, I'll be crucified, what he was saying was this. I have, ra I have raised the dead a few minutes, a few hours, a few days, four days. I know how I'm going to defeat death once and for all. I'm going to enter into it myself, and I'm going to beat it from the inside out. <laughs> you know what Peter said? Peter, the one who had the revelation, he said, not so, Lord. He said, get behind me, Satan. Satan was talking. Not so. He said, get behind me, Satan. You savor the things that be of men, not of God. 
So Jesus went into death. When he died on that cross, he was carried into hell. Oh, brother, no, no, no. Somebody's got to go to hell for the price of Adam's treason. It's either him or you. Once somebody's going, because that was the harvest. The Bible said in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, he who knew no sin was made to be sin. He didn't carry your sin. He didn't carry it. He became your sin. He became your sin so that you might be made the righteousness of God in him. So he, he became your sin so you could become his righteousness. And when he died on that cross, Psalm 22 tells how, this, how these bulls of Bashan, those are the things that go all the way back to the giants. Bashan, and it said they gaped upon him like a lion, pulled his spirit out of his body, and he was descending into the pit of the damned. And he said, save my darling from the power of the dogs. But he gave the sermon in Psalm 22. When did he pray that psalm where it says he would go there, he would do this, he would pay the price, but he would rise again and, and praise God in the great congregation? When did he do that? Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. It wasn't a known language. There was Italians there. There were Greeks there. There were Hebrews there. But they said it had to be interpreted. He began to pray in other tongues. And he was praying Psalm 22, where it says, They part my garments, and for my vesture they cast lots. They pierce my hands and feet. He's praying all this in tongues while they're doing it. While the preachers are saying, if you're him, if you're him, if you're him, come down. So he just starts praying in tongues. He is the New Testament. He starts praying in the Spirit while they're doing it. Do you know how the 20, you know how the 22nd Psalm ends in the Amplified Translation? It is finished. And that's what they heard him say last. So when he died, the great prophecy of three days and nights, the earth remembered. And the last Adam was put in a tomb. But his spirit descended into hell with our sin. And after three days and nights, Hebrews 1, God called down into that pit and said, Thy throne, O God, is forever. Let all the angels worship you. And at that moment, the Scripture teaches us that the glory of God raised Jesus from the dead, but it also says the Holy Ghost raised him from the dead. At that moment in time, after three days and nights, for the first time, the Spirit of God, the man of fire, went down into the pits of the damned, searching for the beloved. And when he found him, he laid down on top of him, just like in the very beginning with the first Adam. And he began to, to speak those same words that Jesus, and he put them in there. And when he did, the the, the demonic spirits that had tried to tear and emaciate him and annihilate him begin to hurl off of him, hurl in every direction. And don't you know at that moment, Satan was screaming, you can't have him. You can't have him. That sin. Can't you see that sin? And then the mystery was revealed that was hidden in God. Yes, it is sin, but it's not his sin. He never committed a sin. Oh, come on. It is sin, but it's not his. The sin stays, but he comes out.
the mystery of the great prophecy. Here's my close. You ready? Here it is. In Luke 9, I want you to look at verse 29. And as he prayed, the fashion of his countenance was altered. And his raiment was wide and glistening. Peter and John and James saw something they had never seen before. It happened in front of them. The scripture says in Luke 9, they were asleep. And it said they woke up to see this. I want you to think about that just a minute. It says the Lord came to pass on the eight days after these sayings, he took Peter, John, and James and went up into a mountain to pray. And as he prayed, the fashion of his countenance was altered and his raiment was white and glistening. And behold, there talked with him two men, which were Moses and Elias, or Elijah, who appeared in glory and spake of his decease, which he should accomplish in Jerusalem. But Peter and they that were with him were heavy with sleep. And when they were awake, they saw his glory and the two men that stood with him. And it came to pass as they departed from him, Peter said unto Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three tabernacles or churches, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. While he thus spake, there came a cloud and overshadowed them. And they feared as they entered the cloud. And there came a voice out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved son hear him. And when the voice was passed, Jesus was found alone. And they kept it close and told no man in those days any of the, those things which they had seen. They saw him transfigured in front of them. For too long, my brother and sister, the church, the church as a whole. I had a Hebrew friend of mine the other day told me something. And it was so powerful. And he looked at me and he said, you know, people, people look at Christmas and, 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 and they, they put a lot of emphasis on Christmas. And he said, but you know, he said, I believe the, the main thing is that resurrection day. <laughs> he said something so powerful it will burn in your spirit. And I said, yes. Because, see, here's the thing. After the birth, each, each event of Jesus carries its own celebration. At his birth, we celebrate glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. We celebrate. But if you stay right there at the manger, you'll never walk with him through the miracles. But if you stop in the journey of the miracles... And you cling to the cross where he died. Then the only person that benefited from the miracles was those that when he walked the earth, if that's as far as he went. He had to go beyond that cross. So then they put him in the tomb. He went into hell and paid the price, rose again after three days and nights. You can't just stay at the tomb and cry. But when the stone was rolled away, resurrection power came. He walked out of the tomb. That's an explosive power over death, hell, and the grave. But if that's where it stopped, it would have been great but not complete. Because then you had to go to the ascension where he ascended to the right hand of his father. And he said, you'll know I got there when I send him back said, you'll know I made it and accomplished it all when I send the Holy Ghost. So then you've got to go to the upper room. What is the upper room? It's the second crowning. The coronation of the Most High. The coronation of the Christ. And he comes to you. And it's the second crowning. And you there begin to be crowned with fire. 
And we know this and we think, praise God. But there is something that happened here in Luke 9 that God is longing for us to look at. You see the born Savior, the lowly child in the manger. You see the, the, the crucifixion. You see the death, burial, and resurrection. You see the ascension. You see baptism in the Holy Ghost. But now that you've done those things, why? We must turn aside and see him transfigured in front of our eyes. We must look at the transfiguration because that was he showed his men he, him as the king, him as the total glistening glory, dignity, magnitude, majesty. It showed the glory, the excellent glory that came upon him. And it comes when, when we begin to look at the transfiguration. He must become transfigured in our eyes so that we realize he is the risen king. He is the one who now lights heaven with his countenance. He is the one now. He is the majesty on high. He is the excellent glory. He is the one that backs every word you say when you speak this word. We have to begin to look at the transfiguration and let him become that in our eyes. Why did you say that, Brother Robin? Because everybody is looking for the glory to come. But it says here, the glory came when they saw him transfigured. We must see. He gave them a glimpse of everything when it was all over what he looked like in heaven. Let him become that to you. Let him become all of those things to you. Go by every, go by the birth, go by the death, go by the, the burial, the resurrection, go to the ascension, go to the upper room. Get baptized in the Holy Ghost. And then say, I have all of these things. I have all of this. Now what? See him transfigured. See him in the excellent glory. And it said, when they saw him, the glory came. And overshadowed. Well, when was that? You know, how do we know when that's happened? Well, it said there were two prophets showed up. So when you see prophets begin to show up again, the glory's close. It is a sign of something to come. So if I can get you to stand on your feet tonight all over the house, we've probably said more than, than we know we've said tonight. But if, if I can, if you've never made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, this is your night. This is the night, you know, Paul said this. He said, if you believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead and you confess with your mouth that he is your Lord, you shall be saved. Did you know that that's what Paul said to do? That came from a man who, who his past, which was, that's what, that was his thorn in the flesh, is dealing with his past. It was a man that finally overcame all of that. And all he did, you know he prayed the shortest sinner's prayer in history. Do you know he did? On the road to Damascus, when that light hit him, he fell to the ground. And Jesus said, why are you persecuting me? He took it personal. You persecute his church. Jesus took that personal. He said, why are you persecuting me? It's hard for you to kick against the pricks. He said, who are you, Lord? That's it. It's the only prayer you ever have record that he prayed. He believed he was Lord. He believed he rose from the dead and said it with his mouth. So he told that. So tonight, if you don't know Jesus, why don't you do that? Why don't you pray with me right now? Why don't you do that? Say, Lord Jesus. Well, there's got to be more than about 28 in here. 
Say, Lord Jesus, I believe in my heart that God raised you from the dead. And I confess with my mouth that you are my Lord and personal Savior. Forgive me of all sin. Cleanse me. And I make you the Lord of my life right now, tonight. I am yours. And you are mine. Hallelujah. Now say, say amen. amen. Now, watch this. Now, we don't want to stop there because you want to go on to the upper room and get baptized in the Holy Ghost. Well, I don't believe in them other tongues. Shh. <laughs> Man, I was in a, I was in a Baptist church one time down in, down in uh, Ashburn, Georgia. And we carried a youth group down there. We were doing dramas. And, and then I'd, I'd pray for people in a prayer line. And uh, this was one, of, this was a, this is a pretty good sized church, you know, just traditional looking. And the, the pastor wasn't, he'd been messed with. And so that, so we were, we were out there, you know. And I was going down through there praying for people, just praying for them. They, they, I called for a prayer line. So I went down and started praying. Somebody fell out. Hold on. Hey, looking. <laughs> About that time, my little brother was on stage with us that night, and he gave a message in other tongues. I think that was before I prayed or after I prayed. Well, I forget which one. Anyway, he gave a message in other tongues. And I was, I was thinking, dear God. I thought, I thought, Lord, let somebody else interpret it. Because if I interpret it, they're going to think we planned it. Their aerobics instructor interpreted it in front of everybody. So then I'd lay hands on people and they fell. This one fell. That one fell. Before you know it, man, the night, there was just a fog. Oh, you ought to see how thick it is now. And that fog was all over the room. And they started, the deacons were coming up, and they came up here like this to me on stage. I'd lay my hands on They'd hit the ground. This one deacon was coming up, and he was walking toward me like this. And I was about where that mock stand is, and he got about this close, and he just fell. When he got up later, he said, I don't know how to explain it. He said, I don't know what to say. It was like a pipe. You had a pipe in your hand wrapped in velvet and touched my chest. <laughs> Down he went. I never heard it explained that way, but he did it. <laughs> so anyway, that was, a big, that was a big deal, man. They didn't know what to do. That pastor was up almost all night answering phone calls <laughs> from congregation, was he not? The next night, mmm, mmm. If I'm not mistaken, I don't know what church they came from, but I would imagine it was the church of God in Christ came the next night. When that door opened on that Baptist church and those sisters came down with their tambourines, <laughs> they, heard, they, they heard the Holy Ghost was in the house. Man, I'm telling you, that place come apart. We had a, I don't know how many we have saved. Was it, it was either 60 or 160. Something like that. People getting saved everywhere. People, people, I mean, experiencing the power of God. And a week after that, I think pastor got fired and he opened the church up across the way. <laughs> and, and the Holy Ghost upends things. So right now, I want you to understand this. People say, well, I ain't never been baptized in the Holy Ghost, but I want to be. I want to speak in other tongues. I want to speak in them tongues. Well, let me tell you what happened to me, and then I'm going to turn it over to the pastor or to Krista or to whoever I'm turning it over to. He, he, when I, I had so many people lay hands on my head. Man, trying to, me trying to get the Holy Ghost. You know, we say get the Holy Ghost. You know what I'm saying. And it just, and they'd say, okay, now speak. I'd go.
I thought, you know, I thought that he'd just take my mouth and just make me speak. Well, I tried and tried and tried. Nothing happened. One day, I went in the back room of that little old trailer we lived in. And I went back there, and I closed the door. And I got on my knees, and I said, Now, Lord, now I'm just being transparent with you. I said, Lord, I said, I'm going to ask you to baptize me in the Holy Ghost. And I said, uh, and I did. And then I said, Now, Lord, I'm going to speak in tongues now. And I said, If I make a fool out of myself, only me and you know it in this room. <laughs> I did. That's a true story. And so I said, So here goes. And I opened my mouth and started speaking in tongues, and I did that for a while, and then I stopped, and I got up, and I said, well, that was something. And I turned and walked out the door, closed the door, didn't say much else about it. A day or so went by, I guess, I don't know how long. Man, I'd start praying, and then, you know, it don't take long, you run out of stuff to say. And you, and, and you know you'll start repenting at that point. You'll pray for everybody, and then you'll start saying, Lord, forgive me. Lord, forgive me. God, God forgive me. And, and if somebody asks you, you know, you do that over your food a lot of time. Lord, bless this food, the nourishment of our bodies, and our bodies to your service, and forgive us of all of our sin. And if somebody looked at you and said, have you sinned? <laughs> You'd probably say no. Well, then why are you repenting for? Well, I don't know. It's just what we do in case I have. A sin consciousness just weighs on people. So if you sin, the Lord will tell you. And so once you run out of something to pray in English, I'd shift over into them tongues I, I started doing. Oh, man, now everything is open. Now your, your prayer language is unlimited because the Holy Ghost takes hold together with you. And he searches the mind of God and the deep things of God. Hallelujah. So right now, I want you to lift your hands if you want to be baptized in the Holy Ghost and say this out loud. Well, the hands are going up so that these are people who want it. So I want you to pray this out loud. Now see, when you got saved, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost baptized you in Jesus. But now Jesus is going to baptize you in the Holy Ghost and fire. And watch this. The Holy Ghost that lives in you is going to come up on you. You ready? Say, Lord Jesus, baptize me in the Holy Ghost and fire with the evidence of speaking in other tongues as the Spirit tells me what to say. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I receive it now. I receive this baptism now. And I give you praise. Now just start praising him. Come on, all over the house. Lord, we thank you. Lord, we praise you. Now just go from your praise to those sounds you hear inside you. Ola tu kiria sele, aramando gongle zi kistele pa roto. Come on, let it out. Come on. Ora te kile borise. The Bible said he baptized them in the Holy Ghost and they spoke in tongues. You have to do the speaking. He gives the utterance. So come on now. Olo paroto carasia rande ere pa kushingelanga rozo kashle brendo. O koriste akramando ngongalezi kia popokushele ande. E prata, e prata rose e fishion ngongalezi ki e tu prato kusle pa prandoro. O rope e riche ki ando le mando ropa oro pa kusile korestele. In mano grasse pa, colisia reste e harabando grassale. How about that, huh? How about that? Now, now there's so many in this room. Listen to what the Lord said to me. That you, you have just 
let resentment build up until it's turned into hate. And there's certain people you just can't seem to forgive. And the Lord said, I'm going to heal certain things tonight. And some of them are that. So I'm going to ask you if you want to come, you come now and stand right here. And I'm going to pray with you right now. And God is going to, to blow that thing out of you. And you can walk free of that from this point on if you'll come. And I'll have instruction for you if you do. You ready? One, two, three, come. If you're going to come, come on now. Come on now and line up right here. Just for those, just those that, that answered that call now, don't, don't come for anything else right now. I want you to look at something. See, the enemy is holding back and holding down powerhouses in the church. See, this is the elites. These are the, the, these are the ones you belong to God himself. And the enemy has found a way to trap you in such a thing. And it's keeping you from the next level and the next step. But not after this night. Not in a few moments. You say, why don't you just pray? Well, I've got to tell you something first. Because let me show you how the Lord deals with people. Everything he does, he does by faith. He framed the worlds with his faith, his word and faith. Faith, heaven bows to faith. It always comes to faith. You can't forgive by your feelings tonight because some of you were just hurt too bad. Some of you were hurt so severe and so deep that your feelings will never line up with that right now. The only way you're going to do this now is by faith. But here's the good news. God will treat you according to your decision. And if you say, I forgive that person, not because I feel like it, not because they've earned it, I forgive them by faith because my Father wants me to forgive. So in the name of Jesus, I will forgive by faith. God will treat you as if your feelings already line up with that. Do, are you listening to me? You've dealt with this long enough. You are born again. You, you're, you're, you serve the living God. But this thing has got to go. And you've tried and tried. Now we're going to exercise our faith. But when we pray, in just a moment now, I'm going to lead you in a prayer. And when we do, then you're going to forgive by faith. I don't pretend to know how you were hurt. Some is so severe, it don't do to talk about. But I'm telling you something. There is nothing so severe that the blood of Jesus won't cleanse and get rid of. Now, what's going to happen is after we pray, it's going to take place. In heaven, it's done. Now, the next time you see that person, now, some of you will feel free instantly tonight. But the next time you see that person, you'll find yourself, if they're coming down the street, walking on the other side. Don't say, oh, I thought I forgave. You did. These are symptoms of sin. Symptoms of your flesh and your past. You trained your mind to think like that. But it's no longer in you anymore. Does that make sense to you? And you've got to rise above and know the, the wiles of the devil. Once you release it tonight, it's gone. Now when you see somebody that you, that you had to do that and forgive, and those feelings rise up. Don't, don't just fall apart and say, I thought I had done that. You did. You have just trained like muscle memory to react. Every time you think of them, say, oh, I, I forgive them. I just love them. I'm telling you. I, you know, and you just keep doing it. One day you're going to wake up and say this. Lord, you mean that Really? You mean I don't hate them anymore? And he'll say, no, ain't it wonderful? 
I'm very serious. How do I know? How do I know that? Because nothing is taken us but what is common to every man. So are you ready? Lord, right now I bring your people before you, Lord. Lord, these are precious people. They're the people, Lord, that you love with everything you have. Lord, they're yours. Lord, they're your people, but they're my family. And now, Lord God, we come before you, before the throne of grace. Lord, we have received forgiveness from you. And Lord, we are going to extend it tonight to others. Listen to me close before I finish this prayer. Have you ever read the scripture where it says, if you don't forgive, your heavenly Father won't forgive you? Have you ever wondered what that means? Here's what it means. There's only one force of forgiveness, only one. There's not God's forgiveness and your forgiveness. There's just forgiveness. And if you resist forgiveness, you'll resist it from anywhere it could come. And if you resist forgiving others, you will resist his forgiveness coming to you because you're just resisting that force of forgiveness. Does that make sense? So lift up both hands and say it out loud. In the name of Jesus. Come on, shout it out. In the name of Jesus, I choose to forgive. I will not hate. I will not hold bitterness any longer in my heart, in my spirit, in my head. I forgive. I choose to forgive. I forgive by my faith. I love them by faith. I forgive them by faith. And I receive my cleansing in every part of my life. I'll not hold them bondage any longer, ever again. From this night forward, no matter what I feel, no matter what I see, no matter what I hear, I forgive in Jesus' name. Now shout it out, I am free. Come on, you are free. You are free. Hallelujah. How many of you can sense that happen in your life right now? Let me see your hands. Look at the hands, look at the hands, look at the hands. I'm telling you. This, you activated the most powerful thing in existence, your faith. Your faith. God gave you that, your faith. And it will turn this whole situation. Hallelujah. It don't matter what they do. You've already done it now. Now everything that's been lacking in your life is headed to you. Hallelujah. God bless you, my friends. God bless you. We love you, but Jesus loves you so much more. He is the King. He is the Lord. And he's the one that just sets you free. Now, no matter what happens, you tell somebody, oh, no, 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 no. I forgive. Hallelujah. God bless you. Who do I hand the mic to now? Oh, you got a mic. Krista's going to come now. Hallelujah. Look at your neighbor and say, man, it's late. <laughs> but say, it's not too late. <laughs> Hallelujah. How many is glad you came tonight? <laughs> Praise God. What a night. So this has been a long service. This is just Sunday morning at Church International. You know, I'm just curious, how, how many... Uh, faces on the other side of that camera do we have in the house tonight from the 11th hour from Church International. Praise God. It is so good to see you in person. I always like to say it's so good to see the faces on the other side of that camera. And I see some familiar faces. I see the Jesus freaks sitting right there. 
You were sitting to my right the last time I saw you. It's good to see you. Thank you all for showing up. You know, I have to say that besides the state of Alabama, I think the state of Kentucky is one of the most beautiful states I've ever been in in my life. I do. And uh, it's good to be back. And so they, they asked me tonight, they said, would you receive the offering? And um, I said, sure, why not? And you know, me and my dad, we have a lot in common, and just about everything in common. <laughs> and yeah, he said shalom, by the way. But one thing my entire family has in common is the fact that we want to see God's people living the way that God intended on them to live here on earth. You know, we said the Lord's Prayer at the beginning of the night, and there's the one part that says, on earth as it is in heaven. We can look around at this earth right now, and it's not heaven. This is not the way heaven designed earth to be. This earth was created for you to inhabit and occupy until he comes. It, he said, I go to prepare a place for you. This was supposed to be paradise the way it was at the beginning when God created the heavens and the earth. We read that tonight. But the enemy has, after man fell, and deception and lies and sin and everything entered the earth full force. But then Jesus came and we heard the story of redemption tonight. He brought it all back. Which means now you can actually pray on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus became the mediator from heaven to earth. That you can call on the name of Jesus and all the promises in him are yes and amen. And you can call on the name of Jesus and when the father turns, when you say father in the name of Jesus, the father turns, all he sees is Jesus. He says, yes, son, amen. Yes, so be it. So tonight, as you get your seed together, I want you to know that you can call upon the name of the Lord. You can call upon the name of Jesus, the ultimate name, the mighty name of Jesus. And when you say, Father, in the name of Jesus, I hold my seed up, whatever that seed represents, and you hold it up and you say, Father, in the name of Jesus, when Father God himself turns and looks, all he sees is the sinless, spotless Lamb of God, and he says, yes, son, so be it. And then that house gets paid off. And that car gets paid off. And your child gets to go to the school that they've dreamed of going and that you've dreamed of putting them in. And you don't have to live under the thumb of poverty any longer. Poverty is an offense of the curse. Jesus became the curse. Cursed is every man that hangs on a tree. There's one translation, I believe it's the message translation, that actually says he absorbed the curse into his body. We heard tonight that he became our sin. And there's one translation that says in one stroke, he became poor so that you could become rich. And there's a massive deception that went through the earth immediately. And it all is by the hands of religion that says that money is evil and that you shouldn't have money. But the scripture says it's the love of money that's the root of all evil. See, Satan's only anointing in this earth is money. Why? Because money doesn't have a soul. Money buys and sells souls. The same $20 bill that you may be about to put in the offering plate may be the same $20 bill that hired a hitman to take somebody out of this earth. The same $20 
that you used to buy somebody else's meal could be the same $20 used at a strip joint. You see, all money is, is a tool, and what it builds is whatever the builder does with it. If the builder works for the kingdom of darkness, then guess what it's building? If the builder works for the kingdom of God, then guess what it's building? So now you know why the enemy wants to keep it out of your hands. Because he knows what you will do with it. We will build the kingdom. And we will continue to fund meetings just like this one which I have heard the last few meetings, the last couple of nights have been absolutely power packed. We love every speaker that has come here. And I'm telling you, this is what you heard, what the times that we're living in, they're almost unbelievable. The things that we're seeing are almost unbelievable. But the sad thing is, is you need to believe it because it's happening. The scripture says that Jesus said we are to occupy until he comes. I don't see much occupying happening in the body of Christ. Right now, aren't you glad that you're not God because you would come back when that time comes, come back and look around at the earth and go, my God, what have you done? What have you actually accomplished on this earth at this moment? Because if I was God, I'd probably just say, I'm going back home. <laughs> and if, if Paul was still here, we'd be getting a letter. <laughs> Greetings to you. <laughs> Peace be unto you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And then it would say, you are doing a terrible job. <laughs> That's in Krista terms. But we need to, as the body of Christ, number one, quit living under a deception that has just been taught by religion. That's it. It's not even in the scripture. What was that lash for across Jesus' back that he became poor so that you could become rich? What, why did he have to take that one if we're not going to take advantage of it? That was one less he had to take. Thank God he doesn't think like us. His thoughts are not our thoughts. People say, well, you're just a prosperity preacher. Well, if the opposite is poverty preaching, then by God Almighty, slap that label on me because I want to see God's people prosper spiritually, physically, and financially. Prosperity is not just financial, it's spiritual, it's physical, and it's financial. And that's what we should be occupying all three spaces until he comes. Why? So that when the Antichrist does start his reign, he starts it completely and totally broke. Why? Because we occupied every bit of it. So every time you give, do not see it as just another dollar thrown in a bucket. Do not see it as it leaving your life. See it as it is occupying another piece of space in this earth to take it back so that when our kids get on social media and they start scrolling, instead of seeing the trash that they see every single day, they can see reels like, Jesus is the only way. Jesus loves you. No matter what you've done, Jesus can for I don't. Maybe Nashville, I don't know. From here, I'm thinking, you may make it to Churchill Downs, and that's about it. And then you're going to get tired and say, my feet hurt, my legs hurt. But when the Lord says, go somewhere, there's somebody in that country over there that I, I need. 
I need to change this earth. I need to change a generation. I need that voice in the earth. And right now the devil has a grasp on them. You are not thinking about finances whatsoever. You just buy that plane ticket, hop on that bus, get in that car, whatever you need to do, and go. And then whichever life that that person brings into the kingdom, when they get to heaven and you join them, they will come up to you and say, thank you. Thank you. Because if it wasn't for you preaching to this person and them preaching to this person, I would be in a devil's hell right now that wasn't created for me. But now I'm here living with you in eternal life forever. Thank you. You say, can finances do all that? Absolutely. And God intends on you to have them. His people. His people. Why? To occupy. To occupy all the space. To invade this earth with the glory of God. Jesus said, well, Jesus is the word made flesh. But the word says that he made a promise to Moses. He said, my glory will fill this earth. It will fill this earth. Well, we carry the glory on the inside of us. And it is our job to fill this earth and occupy every possible space, every airwave, everything we possibly can until he comes. And then when he comes back, we get to look at him and say, look how many we got coming with us. Look at this crowd. Don't you see these faces? And Jesus says, well done, my good and faithful servant. And it's because we invaded this earth as the body of Christ. And I'm ready to see the body of Christ occupy every area, every space, and invade this place and don't give the devil an inch. So tonight, I want you to stand up on your feet. Whatever you're going to give, you know what? Whether it be $2, $5, $20, I, I don't know, as long as you're obedient. The scripture says that obedience is better than sacrifice. Why? Because if you listen to the Lord, don't just bucket plunk. Don't just give because it's just what you do. Give with significance. And that could be $2, but it's as significant as $2,000 if that's what the Lord told you to give. Why? Because if every single person in this room was obedient to what God said give, then the total amount that was given has your name on it as you gave that entire amount. Why? Because you were obedient. You were obedient. The Lord told me one time, and I'm like my dad, I'm closing. <laughs> Lord told me one time I was, I was a teenager, I wanted to buy Christmas. I was broke, busted, and disgusted as we say. Ain't never been there? Yeah. I couldn't even go through Taco Bell and get off the, get a bean burrito. I don't know. I couldn't buy anything. I was sitting in church one night. The Lord said, give everything you have in your wallet. Everything. And I said, okay. He knew what I had. When I counted it out, I put it in the envelope. It was 65 cents. He knew it. He knew what I had. But I gave it. 65 cents. The next week, I got a call from my best friend's mom. And she said, I I have a friend who's who's putting together this, this group And all they really need you to do is just kind of review a product or listen to this. But they've got this certain group of people and they needed, and at the time I was 18 years old. I know, I looked like that was just the other day. But (laughs) believe it or not, that was over a decade ago. And, um, And so she said, they need a... 18 to 24 year old female from Blount County, Alabama 
I was an 18-year-old female from Blount County, Alabama, and that she said, it's like a two-day thing, and they pay. And at the time, I was like, okay, yeah, sure, I'll go. It was in Huntsville, Alabama. And so I went. That was about, that was about an hour and a half's drive. And I went. And w- once it was all over, we were supposed to be getting paid $400. And that, well, that was a lot better than 65 cents. But they were, they were supposed to be paying $400, and they said, how many people in here drove over an hour to get here? Well, there was just a few of us. I raised my hand. They said, please come see us after, after it's over. So I went up to the table, went to the people that, that asked us to come. They said, because you drove the furthest, uh, you're getting a bonus, and your total will come out to $650. And I was able to go buy the Christmas I wanted to buy for my family. But I was obedient. And I'm sure everybody else in that church gave way more than I did that night. So if they gave a dollar, it was more than I had. But 65 cents turned into $650 in a week, all by being obedient. By being obedient, you say, is this a get-rich scheme? No, it's the Word. (laughs) Because the Word says in Luke 6.38 that when you give, it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, shall men give unto your bosom. For with the same measure that you meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. And when you stand on the word, I promise you, my brother and sister, the word will not fail you. It'll still be standing when everything else falls. The word will not fail you, and it will work when you work it. Can we put that up on the screen? Can we put Luke 638 up? Is that possible? If not, can you pull it out on your phone or something? Or if not, you're going to just say it with me. Do you know it? Well, then Luke 6, 38, it says, give, and it shall be, put yourself in it, given unto me, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over shall men give unto my bosom. For with the same measure that I meet with all, it shall be measured to me again. You say, I believe it, I receive it, I call it done in Jesus' name. Amen. So be it. Praise God. Hallelujah. Well, Pastor, back to you. God bless you all. Thank you so much for having us. Remember and never forget that God is absolutely good. Shalom, shalom. Well, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Wasn't that great? Amen. I want to give an opportunity for everybody to uh, give. We don't want to miss anyone. We're going to go out of here with a shout. Come on, let's get ready. Let's growl a little bit. Growl. Come on, let's growl at the devil. Growl. One, two, three. Jesus. 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 God bless you. Praise God, what a powerful word. Aren't you glad that we can see from heaven's perspective and know what God is really doing? Too often, we look just at what's happening in the confines of circumstances around us. And if we aren't careful, we got we get caught up in this fight or flight and some of us are ready to fight and others of us are thinking, let's get out of here for the rapture. But I'm telling you, God's got something else in store before the rapture. And that is a great outpouring of the Holy Ghost, and he will expose what needs to be exposed, remove who needs to be removed to see that it happens. And I'm excited to be a part of it, aren't you? Listen, if you'd like to see any of this weekend, Hank Kuhneman from three services on Sunday, Kent Christmas last night, or see again Robin Bullock, we archive our services on YouTube at Evangel World Prayer Center in order of date. So you can go there to catch any archive services. Thanks so much for being with us. If you don't have a church home and you're in the Louisville area, we invite you to come and visit us. We're on 
Billtown Road just immediately off the Gene Snyder exit. But if you are somewhere else and you don't have a home that feeds you, welcome to our online campus. We'd love for you to be part of our online church. God bless you. We'll see you next time right here.